Hello and welcome to this short instruction video on the permeability test. This video is part of a series of introductory videos on soil testing produced by the Department of Geoengineering at Delft University of Technology. This video is meant to provide an insight in the permeability practicals as performed in a number of courses at the TU Delft. We use the permeability test to determine the permeability coefficient, denoted by K, of course, and fine sand. The experiment is performed using a constant head permeometer or a Darcy setup. The first part of this video is about the basic principles behind the permeability test. But why do we want to know the permeability of a soil sample? The permeability of a soil tide is desired in, for example, a dike body. This way it is possible to calculate the water volume that seeps through the dike. That way the required volume that must be pumped from a hinterlying polder can be calculated. Or, for example, to determine the soil type that can be used in the construction process of a water retaining body, such as a dike or a dam. Between different soil types, there exists a great difference between permeability coefficients. This influences the seeping volumes through the dike body. A third and last example includes water purification. Dutch water authorities often use the dunes for water treatment. Water is typically injected for treatment and then removed later. It is important to know the permeability of the soil so that an equilibrium situation can be reached. This equilibrium situation is important so that extreme fluctuations in the groundwater table can be avoided. As explained, the permeability of two soil samples can be determined by using a Darcy setup. The most important components of a Darcy setup include a column filled with two types of sand, in this case coarse sand and finer sand on top, a series of riser tubes that can be used to determine the total head H at different locations in the column, the riser tubes are connected at fixed points from which the elevation head, denoted by Z, can be determined. The total head and elevation head will be elaborated upon in the next few slides. A valve can be used to switch between downward flow or upward flow through the soil sample. A flow of water will be injected through the soil sample using a constant elevation head on top of the soil column. Note that to create a constant elevation head there should be a slight overflow at the top of the soil column. To determine the permeability, the total head H and elevation head Z at different locations in the soil sample can be measured using the riser tubes. The rising tubes are connected to a measurement board from which the total head can be read. Darcy's law relates the ratio of head difference to flow path, in this case a change in elevation, to the flow rate. The only unknown in this equation is the permeability K, which can now easily be resolved. Note here that dl is the distance between two connection points of riser tubes within a soil sample. It is not to be confused with the change in elevation head, although in this setup they are equal. To give some insight, a student could ask themselves how this equation would differ if a horizontal flow is considered instead of a vertical flow. What would happen to the dl term, and what would happen to the equation if the, if the location head is considered for horizontal flow? A question that the student should be able to answer is, why is there a minus sign in this equation? The total head can be related to the elevation head and pressure head using the following equation. The total head, denoted by H, can be measured from the rising tubes. The total head is the sum of the elevation head and pressure head. The elevation head, denoted by Z, is measured at a connection point between the riser tubes and the soil sample. If the elevation head and the total head are known, the pressure head and the corresponding water pressure can be calculated using the following equation. After we've established the basics behind the permeability test, we can take a look at the different steps to be conducted in the practical. This image shows the Darcy setup as used in our experiment at the GeoLab at Delft University of Technology. Compare this figure with the figure shown early in this video showing the schematic of the Darcy setup and see whether you recognize all the components. Blue dye is added to the water used in this experiment for the benefit of visibility, and the used sand samples are shown in the bottom left in the figure. The properties are shown on the labels. The first step is to fill the column with the sand samples. It is important to know the soil properties beforehand. Determine the grain size and mass of the soil samples both before and after filling the column. Why do you think that it is important to know these properties? Prior to filling the column, make sure that there is a weak upward current present. Start by filling the column with coarse sand. Fill the funnel while making sure to keep the bottom closed using your finger. Place the funnel over the column and release the sand steadily but slowly into the column. Fill the column up to a point 1 cm below the fourth connection point. Make sure that both connection points 2 and 3 are within the sand layer near the bottom and near the top of the sample respectively. After filling the column with the coarse sand, use a rubber hammer to slightly consolidate the sand layer and to flatten the top of the sample. Repeat the process now using the fine grained sand. Prevent mixing of the coarse and finer sand. 
by very carefully releasing the first two centimeters of the finer sand. Fill the column up to a point one centimeter below the sixth connection point. Make sure that point four and five are within the fine sand column. Again, use a rubber hammer to slightly consolidate the finer sand layer. Do this carefully to prevent any mixing between the coarse and finer sand. After using the rubber hammer to consolidate the sand, take a tape measure to measure the height of both the sand columns and also measure the elevation head of the connection points between the riser tubes and the sand column. Reverse the flow creating a current in downward direction. Do this by switching the top valve and by opening the bottom valve. Reversing the top valve should be done carefully. If one twists the valve in the wrong direction, the upward flow will be increased instead, causing turbulent mixing of the two sand layers. Wait until the head in the rising tubes no longer changes. This will take a maximum of 5 minutes. This is important to get accurate measuring results. Using a measuring cup, the flow can be determined. Determine the volume and the required time to reach that volume. Make sure to record 5 samples and note them on your instruction manual. Accuracy can be increased by taking larger samples. For example, make measurements of 200 ml instead of 100 ml. For the last part of this video, we will take a look at some of the results from the experiment. During the performed practicals, the students will make a similar plot. This figure shows the different sand boundaries in yellow and the top of the water column in blue. The y-axis shows the elevation head in the vertical and the x-axis represents the total head. Remember that the total head is a function of both the elevation head and the pressure head. In the top part of this figure, the total head is a constant vertical one. This is because the total head is only determined by the water column. For the sand layer, the slope of the black line changes. This implies that the presence of the sands has an influence on the pressure head. The students must be able to reason why the profile of the total head has this shape and why the profile of the total head is steeper for the finer sand than it is for the coarse sand. That is, why does the total head increase quicker for the finer sand than it does for the coarse sand? Another typical plot is here shown on the right. The y-axis represents the vertical location within the sand and water column. The x-axis represents the pressure in kilonewton per square meter. The brownish line represents the total pressure distribution throughout the column. This starts at the top of the water column. The blue line is the water pressure and the yellow points represent the local water pressure as calculated from the riser tubes. Questions that the students should be able to answer include why the profile has this shape. Why do you think that there is a jump in the blue water pressure line but not in the brown line? And this wraps up the content for this video on the permeability test. Make sure to watch the other instruction videos as well. On behalf of the Department of Geoengineering at Delft University of Technology, we'd like to thank you for paying attention to this video. We wish you good luck with your studies.